All right, awesome. We are live on YouTube. Hi, everybody over on YouTube. Welcome, welcome. Please put your name and location in on the YouTube chat. And let me say hi to a few of you. Hi, Diane in Boulder, June in Ontario. Welcome, Norley in Alaska, Diane in Santa Fe. Welcome, Karen. Hi, Adam. <laughs> welcome, Karen. <laughs> Karen in California. Welcome, Nancy in Pennsylvania. Christine in Hope, BC. We have Sandra in Texas, Marianne in New Jersey, Annika in Germany, Fred in the Netherlands. Yay. Welcome, everybody. So glad to see you all here. So, Adam, let me go ahead and introduce you to everybody as we begin. Adam Apollo has offered insights on global transitions, physics, technology, human spirituality, and the future as a next generation leadership ambassador at the White House in multiple Nexus and other summits at the UN and at conferences and festivals around the world. He is a co-founder of the Unify Movement and two education and technology-based companies, Access Granted and Superliminal Systems. He is an active faculty member, author, and the lead systems architect for several international online academies, including the Resonance Academy for Unified Physics, and the Guardian Alliance Academy for Self Mastery with over 100,000 active students of all ages from around the world across these schools. He's been featured on Gaia TV shows, Coast to Coast AM on multiple occasions, feature films and more. Adam Apollo is dedicated to achieving a sustainable and thriving interplanetary culture. And Adam, your topic for today is the secrets of our ancient origins. And as I was sharing with you before we went live, whenever I see anything from Adam, I always come away with my mind blown. So can't wait to dive in. I know you all will love what he's gonna to share today. So Adam, in your talks, you suggest that our current history is inaccurate. And so this has major implications for all of us. So can you tell us what is wrong with our current history? Yeah, we all go through school and college and academia world growing up thinking that the story that we're being told is extraordinarily well validated. And why is that? Because we all have these big, thick textbooks and they're by these official organizations from Cambridge and they have all these photos and stories and they lead us down a path of assuming that the picture of our history is set. But as you get into some of the details, as I did in going to a, a very humanities oriented college, UNCA in Asheville, and going through some of the history program there and the cultural anthropology program there, I began to recognize that the sort of wisdom inherent in the cultural anthropology program wasn't really deeply being applied to the history program. So in cultural anthropology, you realize, wow, it's always the lens of whoever's studying the site that determines the story that they're going to tell. And uh, my first real uh, big wall that I hit as I was getting into the, the history of humanity was around ancient Egypt because I began to recognize that we have these stories about these sites in Egypt, and I always just assumed they were right. You know, I, I went along with the, the articles in National Geographic. I went along with the stories told in Scientific American, you know, and pointing to the way that the pyramids must have been built. But all of that was shattered very quickly when I actually visited Egypt for the first time in uh, around December 21st, 2012. And that was the year that I founded Unify. I was there with a couple hundred people and had some amazing guides and access to a lot of sites that most people don't get access to. And I'm there looking at these sites uh, with a background of extensive studies in theoretical physics, engineering mechanics, um, technology, and I'm looking at some of the stone structures that are supposedly, you know, crafted using a copper hammer chisel, you know, where the stone was chipped away and then dragged into position and placed into position. And I began to realize very quickly that 
in many of the sites where that's the story, it's absolutely not possible that these things could have been built that way. And I engaged with uh, that during that time and, and especially over years after that in, in going to Egypt again and again with engineers, with other scientists, looking at and reviewing some of these things and recognize that, for example, one of the rose quartz pillars that you see in many different sites, but especially in the Dera area, that they're common um, in the area around the Serapium um, and Saqqara, we see them. Some of these pillars are absolutely perfectly round. And I'm not talking about, you know, approximately circular round. I mean, exactly circular. And they extend up, you know, uh, 30, 30 to 50 feet sometimes. And the width or the diameter of these perfectly round pillars doesn't stay the same width. They actually taper in. And then at the end, they flare out and it's one single piece of stone. I mean, some of these pillars are, you know, 50 tons plus in weight. And if you look at that from an engineering standpoint, what we would do now to create that pillar is we would have a freight train size turntable that would be rotating a massive hundred ton block of stone that the turntable could barely handle because it's really difficult to, to rotate things at that weight and especially at speed. And then you'd have to have a diamond saw that is two stories tall. And that two story high diamond saw would have to be able to be tilted and angled while the main stone is rotating, carving, chopping it down and eventually getting it to the point where it could smoothly sort of form that line. And even that is not gonna be able to explain the top of a pillar that flares out and goes into a piece of art. And so I had to come into recognition through my process in some of these different sacred sites around the world, not only Egypt, but in Peru and in Mexico, um, and then looking at and studying the ancient sites studied by my colleagues, um, Robert Schock, for example, who's done extensive studies uh, in many other sites around the world, uh, Graham Hancock, who's also a friend, uh, and, and came to the realization that our history is fundamentally wrong. It's, it's, not, it's not just off a little bit, it's absolutely wrong. Our study of the origin of civilization, our study of the technological capacities of the peoples during these different time periods, possibly even the timelines of things like dynasties and when and how and where different people existed. Because if you're extraordinarily wrong in one point in a historical review, you're likely wrong in other areas. And I developed a lot of compassion looking at that too, realizing that a lot of these guys were just simply British archaeologists who end up meeting with, you know, local Islamic guides, both, you know, coming from very strong religious backgrounds, one Christian, one Muslim, and trying to translate information from a culture that is so vastly different from theirs, that the best they could do is try to analyze and create a story that would make sense and fit into their uh, sociocultural narrative. And they did a decent job creating a great story, but a lot of the roots of the story are false. Yeah, wow, thank you for this. I've been reading Magicians of the Gods by Graham Hancock lately, and it completely mm. blows all of the time frames out of the water, too. You know, and mm. the discovery of yeah. Tepe like just blows up all of the time frames that we previously thought. It's it's so fascinating. And also, mm. you know, academically and research-wise, there are a lot of the anthropologists who have built their career on these dates and certain assumptions and don't want to see it all overturned now that they've been working on that for 40 to 60 years. So it, it's really yeah. hard to shift the perspectives that are in place. But That's right. It's happening. And even harder for academics. I mean, you have teachers in, in the academic world and they're trying to get tenure and they've been teaching something a certain way for the last 20 years to to try to to try to shift that in a massive way i mean this is something we come up against in physics a lot but in history 
you know, again, it's, it's the history, right? It is, it is the like accepted history and it's yeah. scary to go outside of that. It's scary to try to branch off. And a lot of people that do in physics and history and other sciences um, and, and areas of study, they get pushed into the pseudoscience category. They get pushed off the edge as if they're, oh, those crazy guys who don't believe that the pyramids were somehow built in less than 30 years with 3.2 million stones and each of those stones being put in place in under three minutes. Boy, they're crazy, right? right. right. But they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't think about the calculation. They miss the context. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. My daughter, she's much younger, but she was, uh, they were teaching her about ancient Egypt in school. And she, I said, what did you learn today about ancient Egypt? She would tell me all these things. And I was like, well, you take your tests and then I'll tell you what really, <laughs> what really happened, you know, yeah. or the updated yeah. research anyway. <laughs> yeah, pass the test first and <laughs> then we can discuss the, <laughs> what's right. really going on. Yeah. Right. Mm. Okay. So what are some of the theories that you have come to about our ancient origins and about, you know, how, how does this relate to our different genetic lines? How does this relate to our, you know, who we really are? Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you get into the heart of a lot of these different sites, what you start to see is incredible similarities um, between sites in Peru, sites in Bolivia, sites in Egypt, sites in Mexico, um, Goblet Tepe, um, there's all kinds of connections, uh, stone circles in Ireland, for example, and across the UK. Um, and the similarities are fascinating because they sometimes have to do with architectural formats. Uh, my friend Jamie Janover loves to post this one image that has uh, a photo of an entry portal to a site in Egypt and a site in Indonesia and a site in Mexico. And they're all absolutely identical. I mean, slightly different stone, of course, the types of stone are different, um, but the architecture is identical. Um, we see mathematical similarities between the architecture of pyramids in Mexico with things in Egypt and also in Indonesia and other areas. Um, those mathematical similarities you could think of as coincidences at first, but as you start to dig into them deeper, you realize that the level of mathematical knowledge and complexity is beyond our current mathematical knowledge and complexity. Meaning, you know, <laughs> when you consider what we're capable of doing now, the fact that I'm talking to you all instantaneously over a computer network that's transmitting my image and my sound to you in real time, you know, across the planet, we figured that out with our current mathematics. But what they were doing had a universal lens into the mathematics of measurement, the constants, proportional relationships between actions and physics and forces in space time. Um, and clearly they were able to build things and move things that are simply beyond our current engineering capacities right now. Um, we, we, we all in many cases could not do what they did. For example, there's an area in Peru called uh, 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 Tiwanaku. I think it's in Tiwanaku. And there's these massive, massive stones. And they're, they're 200 tons each, some 300 tons each. And the stones are literally pressed together as if they were like soft clay. But these are extraordinarily hard, eight on the hardness scale plus granite structures. Um, and, and there's literally no cracks between them. They have smooth curves and edges and as if somebody just took Play-Doh and just, just kind of just stuck them together, you know, like, boom, boom. and not just a few, but like a thousand stones along the wall, you know, uh, just wave after wave after wave of stone structures. Um, and in fact, I actually, I have an image of that. I could show you guys real quick if you want to see, because a few of these things are just really quite incredible to, to take a look at. Um, this is from uh, one of my presentations um, on some of these sites, but this is the kind of wall that I'm talking about. And you can see the person over here on the right and get a sense of how large these stones are. And they're not cut into squares. They're not cut into cubes. They're, they're pressed into these positions. 
they're shaped in this way. And so, you know, and there's not just a few of them. This is the entirety of that wall, right? <laughs> like it's absolutely gargantuan. And, and so what we begin to see is that there's this knowledge and this state of wisdom of clearly a highly advanced civilization and not just one that existed in one place around the world, but one that existed in many places around the world. And we begin to glimpse that these legends and mythologies around this sort of lost golden age that are embedded into Hindu scripture, are embedded into even Greek mythology through the stories of Plato and the stories of Atlantis, um, that are woven into the flood stories that we've heard from everything from Christianity to other religions and other spiritual groups and other obscure, you know, um, small cultural groups around the planet. And we, we begin to see that there's this highly advanced civilization that existed before the end of the last ice age. So that puts it over 13,000 years ago. And that this highly advanced civilization had mathematical knowledge and technology uh, in some areas beyond what we have now. And it's not to say that like, oh, well, we're way behind and, and, and well, where's their, where's their airplanes and how come they didn't have computers or did they, or what are these things? It's, it's really not about comparison at that level. It's more about acknowledging that the path we've taken is just simply different. And so we have different advancements in technology now than they had at that time. But they're, they're, we don't know how to work with stone in the way that they did. Um, and perhaps they didn't know how to work with, uh, you know, liquid crystal displays the same way that we do. Then again, we're also talking 13,000 years ago, plus some cases 50,000 years ago. So how much do we actually have of the evidence? How much of that stuff would be lost? How much of the stuff was destroyed? Um, there's certain sites in Bolivia where it's clear that these massive stones were interconnected by what looks like these spots where there was some kind of metal lacing or metal bars connecting these things, helping to create a resonant container. Um, but we don't see the metal anymore. And imagine, you know, if they were using metals like gold, metals that were like more advanced and, and or rare and used in a lot of these sites and areas, do you think they'd actually still be there when we are exploring them now? I mean, the potential for the cultures over thousands of years to rob that material, to take it, to do other things with it or use it in certain ways. Um, there's, you know, there's 13,000 years worth of opportunity for that stuff to disappear. So um, it's it's a it's it's a deep, deep inquiry into um, who we are and where we came from. And it's clear that the story we've told of who we are is not actually who we are. And some of these sites get really interesting because as we look into areas around Peru, we also start to see um, really, really fascinating things like collections of mummies, for example. And these mummies, you know, are not human. And the idea that there's mummified remains that are not necessarily human in origin and to the point where we've literally studied the genetics of the, some of the material in some of these mummies and found that there's no paternal haplogroup. And this one mummy that uh, Nassim Haramein was able to uh, extract tissue from uh, in Peru while during the time that we were there on a trip and send to several universities, when we got the genetics back, there's no paternal match in humanity. There are a few paternal maternal matches. In other words, the mother line, we can see some human DNA. But in the father line, we did not match any haplogroup. And now, is it possible that there's an error in that? Yeah, it is. But the skull of this being is also like this long. So where is that being come from? And what about these giants that we hear about? And, and the more we we dig into this, the more we start to see that, that who we are and where we came from might be a much more complicated story uh, than just hanging out on this planet evolving from monkeys. Incredible. And there, there's also the fact that we, when we look at, you know, the, the furthest ancient artifacts that we have in Egypt, or when we look at Gobekli Tepe, 
these are more advanced than, than the more recent findings, right? The, the more recently dated findings. So it's like we've devolved over time, right? So we know that we actually came from this much more advanced place, you know, in some way, right? So mm. can you tell us about Atlantis? Was the Atlantean civilization real? And, and what does this mean for us today? Yeah, I believe the Atlantean civilization was absolutely real. And not only from my, my studies uh, in different sites around the world, but also through my direct experience of having memories from that time and meeting many, many other people who have memories from that time. Um, I've been assembling notes on this for, for many years since I was about 18 when I started having some memories from that time period. And, and in, in perfect honesty, it's part of what deeply encouraged me to continue digging and studying, you know, when you don't have a personal relationship or a personal interest for self-discovery, you know, sometimes things that aren't just aren't that interesting to you. Um, I feel like a lot of the people that I've encountered who have memories from other times, uh, other lives, other worlds, even perhaps, um, a lot of times they also got really excited in history class during the portion of history class that covered that era. And otherwise, you know, they could care less. They fell asleep during the civil war or whatever, you know, it's just like, doesn't matter to them, but these certain cultures and certain time periods are uh, deeply inspiring them. And for me, uh, as I've unpacked and understood this civilization, I've begun to recognize that it is a planet scale civilization uh, that during the ice age, there was a renaissance in a sense of peoples coming together because the ice was covering a lot further from the poles. It was really cold and frozen, but it made it easy to travel across the polar regions to other continents and other areas. And then you have a highly advanced seafaring civilization that gets pressed into this equatorial band uh, and inside that band, you know, the sort of 19 degrees above and below the equator, we find all of these major sacred sites. Uh, literally, like you can grid almost every one of the major sites on the planet to these particular points around the world. And they're not even randomly spaced within that grid. They're actually precisely placed on you know energetic points when you laid over platonic solids onto the planet and you look at energetic intersection points um, and there's a, a bunch of people that have done great work on that um, going all the way back to uh, uh, anti-gravity and the zero point grid which was a book that I got uh, when I would think I was 19 something like that um, amazing book I still keep on my shelf um, and as you as you begin to assess this um, well, for me, what I began to find is that I knew I was part of a city in this civilization called Atlantis, uh, that we call that, um, but that was much more than one city. It wasn't one location. And so these different resources and proofs and, and ideas and theories coming from different archaeologists about where Atlantis was and what city it was in and what ocean it got sunk under and all of that, all a lot of them have accuracy. They're just pointing to different cities that were part of a single civilization. Um, in my memories of that time, I lived on a peninsula in a city made of mostly white stone with beautiful gold and purple um, shaped domes and structures on the tops of like white towers. Uh, with bridges between them and uh, it was gloriously beautiful and we had uh, been developing different technologies using crystals as memory structures and as information transmission systems and one of the projects that I took on at that time uh, which I still think is fascinating and related to some of the work that I'm doing now is, uh, is developing this entanglement system where you have a central crystal pillar, you do a ritualistic ceremony using sound in particular to vibrate a collection of crystals around that pillar. And then what we did was take the individual crystals around that central pillar and uh, include with each one a set of rune stones and assign each one a rune. 
and then take those crystals and put them in different locations. Uh, some in the same city, some went on ships to other cities and other locations far away. And you would have in a temple uh, this crystal and a couple people that were designated as keepers that developed a relationship with that crystal. And you would select a rune stone for the city or the location or the temple that you were wanting to contact. And you place that with the crystal, establishing sort of a mental bond and entanglement bond with that rune, which connects to that crystal in that location and this crystal that you're using and send a communication through this thing. And what would happen on the other side is that someone in the temple, or if it's you, you know, you're walking around and, and the crystal just flashes in your mind. It just pops into your head like a flash. You go over to the crystal and you look at the rune grid. And what you would notice is that one of those runes would be lit up um, energetically, more subtly than we think of now with, you know, lighting up with, you know, lights and having to shoot photons out to see stuff, but subtle quantum vacuum fluctuations that the eye can actually pick up with higher sensory perception and take that rune and place it with the crystal and then basically tune in and receive the message, the transmission. And then the crystal would like flash in your mind when the transmission is complete and you could send a message back. And so this was very sort of like primal phone system, primal text messaging, right? And one that involves and augments the natural capacities of the human body and the human being that is telepathic, that we have those capacities naturally is something that most of us are aware of, especially mothers out there. <laughs> and, um, and as we you know, engage with this ability and this skill, we start to bring back in some of the gifts that have been latent within our species for many, many, many thousands of years. So that's a um, little bit, and I know I went that's on super for a while. Powerful. I, I love that you shared that with us. And you know, this is a this is a glimpse into what we're really capable of. Yeah. And I mean, just imagine if we were fully turned on all of the senses that we that we used to have, you know, and I'm sure that thing probably did light up like a neon light. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we could fully, fully see. Um, that's, right. that's, that's super beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I want to ask more about that, but we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll stay on track. So, okay. so, so talking about, you know, this concept of Atlantis and like the bigger question of where did we come from? Right. Does this then mm -hmm. extend out into star systems and extraterrestrial people, you know, so how can we learn about that? How can we reconnect the dots even? That yeah, that. absolutely. Well, the entry point is about looking at the stories that the people have told around the world. And in almost every culture, if we get down to the indigenous stories and mythologies of the people that were on the land the longest, what we find is that at some point or another, they point to sun gods and goddesses coming down to talk to them and teach them and connect with them um, or uh, kachinas you know and the blue star kachina or the nomos people of the dogon that came down in a ship and made a pool of water and talked to them that looked like dolphin beings you know and told them how the orbits of sirius a and b you know work uh, to, you know, you, you, you name it, to the Tuatha de Danan who arrived on the shores of the British Isles, riding clouds, bearing with them four sacred gifts from three islands in the sky. You know, like what are islands in the sky, right? And how do you translate that? Like you, you got to think about the mindset of, of people's you know, from a long, long time ago. And there's different ways, different language that we may use to talk about things. But what is very clear is that whether it's Taoist, whether it's uh, Hindu and, and ancient Veda scripture or Native American or South American or uh, indigenous, you know, uh, Aboriginal Australian, they point to connections and relationships with star beings all over this galaxy. And sometimes specifically by star system, 
Sometimes it's more broad. Sometimes like the Maya, it's very integrative. And they say that the four corn people of the earth came from the, the four different directions inside of the, the Milky Way galaxy, basically the river in the sky. And, and then we start to see like that the corn people are actually the different races that we point to these different sort of overall genetic dispositions of color of skin, of body structure, of facial shape. And, and there's certainly a huge amount of contention inside of the biological scientist community in the study of our genetics as humanity, specifically around, is it possible that for two different humans, one of whom decides to stay in Africa, for example, and another ends up traveling and then living, you know, up in the Nordic lands, that, that then you end up with, after frankly, not really that much time, you end up with, you know, a, a massive seven and a half full foot tall Nigerian guy with beautiful bluish skin and just like very different facial structure, completely different body structure than me and me, you know, with like, you know, Nordic blood and Irish blood. And I'm like, I'm like next to this guy. And we are, we are, we are the same. We are the, actually the same species, but how did the genetic markers change and the gene markers change that drastically to give us those appearances in those differences um, and the diversity of humanity is exquisite and it's so beautiful and we have such diverse lines and when you start to really get into this what starts to reveal itself is this fascinating perspective that perhaps different parts of the different gen genome pathways within humanity may actually be triggers from hybridization in some form or another whether that's mating with humans and there's tons of stories of gods mating humans and making demigods and a ton of these cultures um and and that those genetic lines may be from different star systems and that each of these star systems have have sort of root cultures root genetics root connections and that many of them came to earth at different points in time and or merged and combined with humanity and set us into different pathways or enhanced or grew us in certain ways or, or learned from us in different ways. And, you know, and then while all of that may have been clear leading up to the fall of civilization at the end of the last ice age, we lost that knowledge completely. And it's not that it's entirely gone. It's that the codes of where it's hidden are deeply encrypted. And the encryption is around the structure of language that we use, the mathematics hidden in different sites, the meanings of sacred letter sets, rune sets, connections between the numbers of letters in different languages. You know, for example, the connection of the number of letters in the Greek language with the number of runes in the Fuhark runes, right? Like how, how are these things synonymous and, and why? And, and why are some of the magical traditions inter so deeply interconnected? And we don't know why, and we don't know what the root of it is. The same elements, the same, you know, pointing to the four directions, the same, you know, meanings of chalice and, uh, and staff or tree or club and pentacle or diamond, you know, as we see in the playing cards or spades and swords uh, and, the, and the weaves between these different metaphysical and um, mythological traditions around the planet. Yeah, and that connects in with what you talked about earlier, the guy with the, with the giant skull and you know, no paternal haplogroup in the, in the DNA. So yeah, there, and there have to be more clues to this in the DNA as well. I know that's something Greg Braden talks about. I don't know all the details of it, but uh, it's mm -hmm. gotta be there, there. I mean, the clues are within us, they're all around us, <laughs> right? There's, there's so much to uncover. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. it is in our genetics. It's in our genetics so deeply that 
as I've learned through my own work and my own studies in this area and, and working with hundreds of people with memories from being on other planets, what I began to find is that there are specific physical triggers that you can find that are imprints of these galactic civilizations within humanity. And so much so that you can fairly well identify certain star systems where someone may have existed before. Now, <clears throat> this gets really interesting because this also expands the science of genetics slightly. And that is to say that we are not just the combination of our maternal and paternal lines. We are not just the combination of our mother's DNA and our father's DNA. We also in inject into our incarnation cycles, our own soul genetics, our soul genome. This is why and how it's possible for there to be children that are sometimes born to two parents that don't look anything like those parents. There is an additional set of information that's coming into how epigenetically the genome codes itself into the forming of the proteins and the structure of the body. And that is incredible to think about because what that means is that you as a being journeying and incarnating through time into different bodies, never lose that portion of your genetics. There's a part of you that is actually your experiential code which is, you know, has been in, in modern times called junk DNA and or non-coding DNA. And we don't even understand why and how and what it does, but we do know that it has a huge amount to do with evolution. In other words, why your genes that you're passing to your kids is going to be different from just what your parents pass to you, because it's real time connected to your consciousness, your experience, the wisdom that you're bringing from your ancient past into the now. And so when we expand the understanding of genetics to encompass the soul genetics, then we also realize that there are visible imprints of the triggers, the physical triggers of who somebody was in other lifetimes in their body right now. And when you get to the imprints of other star systems, it's even more drastic and powerful. And the reason is because you have to recognize that everything that, that makes me the way that I am in this human body right now, most of the facets of this are actually shaped by the very particular sun that I'm orbiting around. The exact frequencies of that sun's light literally inform so much of my body's processes. And this planet and how it has received that light energy and is in relationship with that star is defining like literally everything around us in the physical world, the types of trees, the plants, the things I eat, the, the water that I drink, the other things that I drink, all of these things are based on this planetary relationship. And so you can imagine that the imprint of another star, its frequencies, its particular energy and the planet, its, its core and its warmth and its plants and its animals and all of that is something that, that lands within the being at a soul level so deeply that you, you can never remove the journey through stars that each of us have been on. Right, right. Yeah, I love that, that explanation. It's really, it really, it like grounds it, you know, it's really powerful to think of it that way. And Going back to the DNA for one more moment here, the just the idea that we have junk DNA, I think, is ridiculous. Like nature is so highly, you know, sacredly, architecturally organized. Why would we have yeah. anything with junk? We can't, you know. So clearly that has a purpose too. And we just yeah, we and our current technology have not figured it out yet. Scientifically. That's right. right. That's right. So yeah. We have so, much, le much to learn. Much, much to <laughs> yes, learn. we sure do. Someday we'll be as smart as the ancient Egyptians. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. We can hope. <laughs> so what does uncovering our true history as a species mean for our future? And just in general, how, you know, how can we move forward with this information? What, what is it helping us to understand and, mm. and know as we move forward? Mm. I deeply believe that our potential to create is inter 
intertwined with the knowledge of who we are from the past. The more we know of the past, the more clear we are about what we can create in the future. And this story changes everything because it says, you're not alone on this planet. You never have been. You're not encountering aliens from other worlds. You are having, in fact, old family members, parts of your family from other worlds visit and check in on the evolution of a species that's gone through massive cataclysms and that is rebuilding itself and just beginning to realize who they are. And in that realization, they will become an interstellar species, just like every other world does at some point that has a species that advances to a point where they recognize that they can travel the stars. And at first they might do silly, stupid things like, you know, create massive tanks of gas and set them on fire and put a seed on the front and ride an explosion, pushing your way to get out of the atmosphere and praying that it doesn't blow up on the way. <laughs> you know, like literally riding missiles. That's what we do <laughs> these days. We ride missiles. <clears throat> and eventually the our understanding of the physics of space opens the door to our recognition that space-time is full of energy and it is this highly dynamic lattice <clears throat> and that gravity is actually just a certain way that space-time moves. And then we start to realize that we can program gravity the same way we program bits of light in the transmissions of our Zoom calls. We can begin to shape gravitational fields, which then unlocks the capacity for us to move without acceleration. Acceleration and gravity are intertwined. So when you're pushing your way through space-time, you're pressing your way through the fabric and it's warping the fabric of space-time. And this is why guys like Stephen Hawking, who are so, have been, were so baked into the modern physics mindset, could not conceive of how it would be possible for extraterrestrial civilizations to visit us because he's thinking from the mindset of acceleration and pushing your way through space. But as soon as you remove the need to accelerate, as soon as you create an envelope that separates the space time within a vehicle from the space time outside, like a you know, really effective force field is a good way to think about it. Suddenly there is no rules in terms of acceleration or speed. So that object can move through space-time, turn in different degrees, turn in any direction, and there's not going to be any G-force, no forces of slamming you around inside the ship, no limits in how fast or slow you can go. And suddenly, now you're learning how to actually navigate space-time in a super luminal manner, faster than light. And when you travel faster than light, you're now jumping to other star systems you're able to go to any planet anywhere, you begin to realize you can transport goods and, and things on your own planet without massive railways and constant endless streams of giant trucks. You can actually portal objects to other locations. And the entire flow of the civilization begins to change because now it's like no one is as attached to having land or like I got to own and control this area because there's all kinds of things to explore. There's whole other worlds to explore. We don't, have, we don't have to fight over this land and we can release population pressure without killing off a ton of the population as you know, some of our world leaders think is inevitable that tons of people have to die for us to survive, which I think is just a sick idea. Just think about the possibilities of where we can thrive. How can we expand ourselves as a species? And, and when you look at new energy systems, new gravity systems, and the ability to replicate matter, you change the entire structure of all of life on Earth. And you begin to see that where we're going is the most exciting adventure we've ever imagined. And that is the adventure of becoming a galactic species. The adventure of realizing we're not alone, the adventure of discovering that we thought we knew a lot, but there is a vast array of beings out there with more knowledge than us in all kinds of areas. We get to go to school again. 
we get to start over in a new way, in a new way of thinking. And we start to really begin thinking about how to become stewards of our planet rather than just use it for its resources and get by and get ahead and have as much money as we can and get ahead of everybody else before we die. We start actually thinking about stewardship over generations and how to ensure our planet stays healthy, how to make sure the biospheres are growing and thriving and beautiful. And so my, my work to this end in this journey is multifaceted. Um, I'm both a theoretical physicist. I uh, envision different kinds of technologies, and I've done a lot of engineering architecture for different advanced technologies that I believe we will create in the future. And I'm interested in creating spaces like this that I'm in, that I know some of the people in chat have been referencing, um, where we are acting in strategic stewardship and guidance with the planet, where we're connected to the local regional communities all over the world and tracking their needs and their offers and their gifts and better managing and, and connecting the dots so that we can actually really thrive as a species together um, in service to all life. Super beautiful. Really, really incredible. Thank you for sharing this, this with us. And what are you working on right now? I would love to hear, you know, anything you want to share about current projects, upcoming things you want our, our audience to know about. Um, yeah. Love to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so phase one for me right now, um, in the bigger scope of things, is building the, uh, the coordination, governance, starship dashboard, distributed social web system that we can use to connect with each other without being throttled by giant mega corporations with lots of other interests other than our own uh, as life, as human beings on the planet. Um, and to be able to help give people the tools to both create economic viability and success for themselves so that they get grounded uh, all the way down to helping homeless people develop the vocational skills they need to uh, to get back in society, to get back in the game, you know, unlock those doors for them. And we have partners that we're working with in that area. Get help is the primary one um, and and build this sort of comprehensive system that helps us to extract ourselves from this uh from this sort of social economy where we are products to these companies and we are being sold to other companies for our data. And we've been turned into marketing instruments where, you know, they don't care what we say as long as what we say doesn't cause disruption, as long as what we say doesn't question the status quo so far that it disrupts their marketing agenda and their marketing engines. Um, and, and I think that I honestly, personally, I believe that I, humanity is beautiful. I have huge amounts of faith in us. And I believe that when we are clear from the, the fields of being sort of manipulated and programmed and pushed to our edges and pressed down and um, treated like, you know, like animals or like robots or objects or lesser creatures, that when people are truly given sovereignty and agency, um, that, that they can change the world together. Like each person changes their world as they gain that sovereignty, that agency, and that power of choice and that clarity about who they are. And so I, I build projects that try to restore that divine gift in each individual, that, that perfect power that is theirs already, you know, that they just maybe have forgotten about or lost touch with. And so in the track towards building this new system, which looks a lot like these dashboards you see back here, that's one of the themes is we call it Stark. It's uh, you know, in play after uh, Tony Stark and Iron Man, um, but, but this 3D Iron Man style dashboard for navigating your social realm, connecting your networks, all of that people can learn more about by going to core.network. That's the code name for it. We haven't released the final name publicly um, because there's crazy moves in the crypto space and everybody's grabbing every name they can. So we've trademarked another name and we're keeping it quiet for right now. Um, and in the way of going to build that, what we've been doing is playing with this NFT space. 
Uh, NFTs, for those that don't know, it's called a non-fungible token. It's really a ridiculously stupid name because it's, a, it's, it's just saying it's not a fungible token. And a fungible token is like a dollar bill, right? So if you have a dollar bill and you have another dollar bill, what's the difference between them? They have no difference. You can use one and the other interchangeably. That's a fungible token. It means that it, there are many types of it and it all works the same way. A non-fungible token is a thing like ownership over a piece of land, and there's no other piece of land like it, or a piece of art, and there's no other piece of art like it. Um, and, and this kind of uh, space within the technology world that's developing is opening up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities. And what's really cool about it is it's not actually about the, the art or the thing, right? It's actually about what's possible for us to make an agreement and an exchange and be in a relationship with each other. So some of what we're working on right now is like fractal systems where you can have a hundred different people working on a film together and each one contributes a portion of that film. And then all of those people and the things they've created, whether those are, you know, NFTs saved or not, like an image or a vector or a, an audio clip or whatever, all of that can go into one NFT that is a film. And mm -hmm. that film, every single time someone rents it or watches it or shares it, every person gets paid instantly. So it's about transforming the ability for us to move abundance within our communities. And, and that's a great first step. And then there's also service contracting through a digital agreement. Like, why do we need lawyers to write up every contract? Why can't we just pop up contract templates, activate that, boom, we've got a service agreement. Now we feel safe. We've got the thing and we're going forward. Um, there, there's so much potential in this, in this space. And we're, we're building prototyping and open sourcing technology in this space in order to both raise money to continue building this full Starship dashboard system that we're working on, um, as well as just to have fun and create art. Um, and so if you guys are interested in that, we have a website called galacticnfts.com. And we have some really, really cool art on there. Um, we just released a Zodiac series that this guy Aphicles created, and it's each sign in the Zodiac, and it, they're just, they're just gorgeous. They're absolutely gorgeous. Um, and the, they're, you know, we charge an ether or a fourth of an ether for some of these different things, um, which can be a couple grand, a couple thousand dollars. But this is a tradable object. So you can literally put it back up for sale and sell it for twice that amount the same day if you want to, or you can keep it and watch as we release projects and the value of these things will increase and increase as the other work we're creating gets out there and, you know, and make it an investment option for your future, for your kid's college or whatever. Um, so it's, it's really fun. We're having a lot of fun in that space. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's keeping things really lively as we're doing the really intense, deep work of building this entirely new infrastructure and system, um, which is a huge project that we've been on for years now. Yeah, that sounds, it sounds like a massive project and it sounds like it's creating whole new ways to create abundance. You know, NFTs are one, but you guys are like taking this to the next level. So that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. What you. was the website Thank again? You. Uh, galacticnfts.com is where you can learn about the NFTs and you can go to core.network. It's also linked from Galactic NFTs. Okay. To learn right. a little bit more about the big scope of what we're building and, uh, and just know that in that space, you know, unfortunately we have to just tease you right now. So <laughs> unless you're, unless you're an investor and you want to, and want to talk and, and have a deeper conversation and I'll show you some, some of what's going on behind the scenes, we have to keep some stuff under the radar because uh, it's, a, it's a very volatile field out there right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you have a fantastic free gift for us as well, right? It's Discover the Initiation Course of the Guardian Alliance. So could you tell us a bit about that? And I'll put that in the chat for everybody here. Yeah, sure. So one of the academies that, that we built um, over the years, I built the Resonance Academy for Unified Physics with Nassim Haramein, uh, the Visionary Arts Academy, and we built the Guardian Alliance. And the Guardian Alliance is, uh, is just such an amazing way to get into 
actual training that's unlike any courses you've ever taken anywhere else. It's, it's, it's metaphysical. It's about developing the chi in your body and empowering your strength and working with your chi. Uh, we have warrior courses, weaver courses, which is like sexuality and social skills, healer courses, wizard courses, which are like high level magic, uh, ambassador and star walker courses. And, um, and the best way to get started is this initiation course that we wrote many years ago. And it's, um, it's really a beautiful deep dive into what does it mean to be a guardian on the planet? Like, what is that, what is that actually about? Because it's not, it's not just about protecting yourself or protecting people or building strong walls, you know, it's actually about learning that, that, there are always different flows of different people that can either see what's happening or not. And when someone is being abused or someone is suffering, if we are not, and we can see it, then we can actually choose to take responsibility and help stop that abuse from happening. We can recognize that our planet's being abused and we can step forward as guardians of that and actually take a stand for doing things a way that is different. And so the Guardian Alliance is about building real life Jedi, people who are integrated across a vast array of fields and who are willing to do the inner work necessary uh, to truly be ambassadors of the of the world that is focused on all life, that is focused on the well-being of all people. Amazing. Incredible. So everybody, Adam's free gift is in the chat here on Zoom and on YouTube. And then also, if you're watching this later as a recording, just scroll down a bit below the video and you'll find it there. And wow, definitely go check out this free gift, get the free gift and check out all of his other work that he's doing. Um, this is, I mean, you are so visionary, right? And this is what we need right now. This is exactly what we need because we got to make such a huge shift. We have to really change things. How, like one, one very quick question, you're talking about, you know, these, um, the, the technology that would enable us to travel into space in a different way. And then we're not so dependent on property and this kind of thing. Like what, what could the time frame be on that? How soon could we make this shift if we get the information out in the, in the right ways? Yeah, well, it's, you know, timelines are timelines are tough because they're they're dynamic to the flow of the people that are moving towards making things happen. Yeah. And, you know, I, I believed at one point that um, based on my conversations with some of the galactic community out there that they were going to come and, you know, land and connect with the collectives on Earth, particularly in 2012. Um, and that was a plan at one point. There was a seven year arc between 2005 and 2012, where mm -hmm. the goal was to get to a state where we were ready enough and enough of us were ready that we were going to have larger scale contact experiences. Um, but things changed and directions change and, you know, people get confused and people get realized they had to deal with more trauma before they're willing to like open up in certain ways. And, and I think that as a collective body, we have an extraordinary amount of trauma to deal with um, personally and collectively. And the longer we delay taking account for that, and the longer we push off dealing with the pain that we're experiencing, the, the further away these dreams that we have and these visions that we have and these possibilities that we have get from us. But as we actually choose to engage our shadows and work with those pain points and open those parts of ourselves and love ourselves and accept ourselves and recognize that the things we've experienced are okay and that we can, we can move forward with the lessons that we've learned from them, then we start to actually bring our destiny into the physical. We begin to manifest it into our reality. And so, you know, my, my goal is that the next 10 years are going to be absolutely massive in their transformational potential for us as a species. Um, and it is, it is my absolute dedication that in my lifetime, you know, we travel faster than light to other star systems. And I know that it's part of my work and part of my role in being here. And there are many others that I align with and that are working on these things too. And, you know, we've got to, we've got to build the Alliance together and we got to do it. And I realized that, you know, without a good free communication system for the planet, one that's actually untethered by these political, these intense political interests and these uh, like 
intense economic interests that are like driving and forcing people into certain channels. Um, if we can truly connect as a people of earth, as a free people of earth, a sovereign community of people on earth, then we will be so much closer to making these things happen and channeling the finances we need to the projects we need to the engineering we need to open the door to a very, very different world. One that is far more balanced and beautiful and interconnected. And um, so I believe we can get there soon if, if we can take these first steps. And that's, that's what I'm focused on right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's put, let's put our energy there for sure. Our highest vibrational energy there. And Uranus is going to move into Gemini in 2025. I think that's going to give it the rocket boost that it needs. <laughs> oh yeah. Uranus, you know, Uranus, Uranus, the, the light bearer, the, the bearer of light coming into consciousness is so powerful. And um, just so you guys know, in five days, uh, Uranus goes direct in Taurus as well. So that's, that's also a powerful moment for new inspiration to come deep into the body, into the sensuality of ourselves um, to embody the change. So let's do it. And with the North node nearby as well. It's really yeah. powerful. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for all of this. Thank I think you. we will uh, need to watch this again to fully integrate all of it. So highly recommend that to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, Thank really you. appreciate all that you're doing, all that you've shared here. Blessings for your work. And thanks for being a part of Into the Mythica. Mm, deeply appreciated. And such an honor. I hope you have uh, amazing broadcasts throughout the week. I know there's some really beautiful speakers. So. Um, thank you everyone for joining me. Um, I couldn't keep track of the chat because we were just in active flow, but I just downloaded it. So I'll check it out and read it later. And thank you for all of your comments and, um, and support. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you. And everybody on here, thank you for attending live with us. We appreciate your live presence in real time here. And also those watching this as a recording. Thank you so much. And join us tomorrow for day five. It's our final day of live interviews. We're gonna begin the day with Dr. John Ryan and he has some incredible next level visionary information to share with us. So I will see you all then. It'll be at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Much love everybody. See you then, blessings.